Hello, welcome to the Flute 360 podcast, where we incorporate a panoramic view of flute-related topics. I am your host, Heidi K. Begay, and this is episode 157, an interview with Jared Tate. Hi, welcome back to the Flute 360 podcast. These next four episodes, we are going to talk with four extraordinary composers in episodes 154 through 157. A little background information, these four musicians and I made contact through the Ultimate Music Business Summit hosted by Dr. Garrett Hope in January of 2021. Because of this event, I was able to make some wonderful music connections that have evolved into new friendships. This composer series brings me much joy because I get to share my new music friends with you. Learn from these aspiring musicians who give you gold nuggets that you can implement today. We talk about their flute compositions, how they perceive the flute voice, recording studio tips, and how to navigate a music career in our current climate. Lastly, I'd like to direct your attention to two great incentives that are going on right now. Flutistry Boston is giving you a 20% discount off of the book, Survival of the Flutist by Marion Gedigian, from now until March 31st, 2021. Use your Flute360 code today to receive your discount. Lastly, Elizabeth Talbert is giving you a 20% discount off of her book, Applied Flute Practice Technique, from now until May 7th, 2021, when you use your Flute360 code. Both links are provided in the show notes below. I would like to note that your purchase helps to support the Flute360 podcast. If you would like to contribute to the podcast, this is a great way to do so. Thank you. Just a quick preface, the interview starts mid-conversation because Jared and I had so much fun reconnecting since January summit. Enjoy the talk. I just love what you're doing. Like now let's put the spotlight on you and what you're Yay. doing and you're Chickasaw. Yes. And um, tell me where you currently live. Okay. Well, you know what I'll do is I'll go ahead and formally introduce my, myself in okay. the language. Um, so, uh, Hello, everyone. My name is Jared Impachichaha Tate. I'm a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation here in Oklahoma, and I'm a professional classical composer. I currently live in Oklahoma City. I've lived all over the country uh, a, a great portion of my life. And 10 years ago, um, I moved permanently to Oklahoma City. Uh, and this is this is now my permanent home. This is where I'm raising my son. Mm. Yeah. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I so appreciate. And that's why a lot of my questions, you know, don't jump right into, like, I know we went to talk about your amazing flute concerto, but a lot of these preliminary questions I'm asking you about mm -hmm. like you and your heritage and, and your clans. And I'm doing that on purpose because I, from what I perceive and I could be wrong and you can correct me if I'm wrong. A lot of what I understand with like music from the native American sense, it's so integrated in life and you know, it's, it's hard to separate this. Right. And so like when I see Eric introduce himself, he does the exact same thing you just did. He mm. introduces himself in Diné. So mm. Navajo, um, actually, they prefer to call themselves Diné, meaning people. Yes. And yes. so the Diné people will do the exact same thing. He'll, he'll introduce himself and state his clans, state mm. who his lineage is. And then from there, there's an understanding and a foundation. And then the rest unfolds, if that mm. makes sense. 
Yep. Yep. I, I completely agree. I always, I always back up to talk about my origins. And so I'll just, I'll just go ahead and start blabbing about that. Mm -hmm. Um, you're mentioning clan uh, names. We also have, so the Chickasaws have clan and house names. And so my clan name is, my clan is Shawi, which is raccoon. And our house name is Impa Chichaha. That's my inherited house name. So both my clan and house names are inherited. And Impa Chichaha means, uh, well, uh, raised a high corn crib is what we say. It's like a raised corn silo where you actually store corn and veggies and, and you on six feet poles and it keeps it away from critters. So it's actually a functional uh, type of a structure. And then our clan system is, is animals. So like, you know, we've got, you know, the Minko is like that lead clan. Minko is our word for our chief. Uh, there's also, you know, um, raccoon, rabbit, uh, turtle, you know, there's garfish, that kind of thing. There's just all kinds of different, animal names to your clan, alligator clan, panther clan, that kind of thing. So uh, we still have a whole, uh, we have inherited, you know, clan names. And um, my, so just about my background, um, my father, Charles, is Chickasaw from Ardmore, Oklahoma. Hmm. And dad by profession is, uh, was a professional uh, tribal judge, lawyer, special district judge. He graduated at the University of Oklahoma Law School. And um, my dad's life was very, very steeped in um, Native politics and was very involved in a lot of the civil rights that was going on in the 70s. And uh, so I became I grew up very informed in Indian country politics um, mm -hmm. as a kid. And uh, so that was dad's profession. But dad also happens to be an incredibly trained classical pianist and baritone. And so along with that, uh, my dad's love for musical theater and opera was also present in my life. And in fact, it's really, it's one of these like old timey pictures you have with, uh, back in the day. And that is here. Here's my dad as, as a as a young person um, would gig with the accordion um, and sing in restaurants. You know, so he was singing arias in restaurants, this, this Chickasaw kid oh, <laughs> back wow. in, in the 60s. And so it's just a really cool image I want to make a movie out of, you know, it's like that kind of thing. <laughs> And so, um, but, uh, dad, uh, oh my gosh, he still sings for his chores. He still canters. And, um, but dad was singing in productions until gosh, five years ago, you know, he's 81 now. So, um, anyway, so dad and I have a very, very strong bond when it comes to both, um, Indian politics and, and classical music. And it's and our conversations just flow back and forth between that all the time. Mm. And so I'm very, very fortunate about having that relationship. And then my mother, Patricia, uh, was Manx Irish. And mm. she was from Lincoln, Nebraska. And um, she came to Oklahoma uh, to, to study school. And she and dad met in Oklahoma. And my mother was a professional uh, dancer and choreographer. Mm. So I grew up between my parents, I grew up with an enormous amount of theater and dance. And so through my mom, I actually have a very unusual knowledge, working knowledge of, of dance history. Hmm. And so uh, like American dance history specifically. And then mom also studied um, all kinds of uh, ethnic dances from around the world. And mom became an expert belly dancer and flamenco dancer. And she also studied in Nigeria and Egypt and went to Europe, oh gosh, three times. And so uh, anyway, mom was just really, really educated in dance history in general. And so my early kind of like, uh, I want to say production heroes, creative heroes in the theater were choreographers like Martha Graham, mm -hmm. uh, Isadora Duncan, Ruth St. Dennis, uh, Agnes DeMille, Ted Sean. The, I, I mean, these, these pioneers of American dance were incredibly influential to me. And one of the reasons was, is because they were very steeped in Greek roots, like Greek mm -hmm. theater, because if you, know, you think about it, it's like what a lot of people say Western music, but actually Western music is really the most beautiful marriage between um, way ancient music between the Middle East and Europe mm. theater in, in particular. And so like Martha Graham was, a, was very, she drew from Greek theater a lot in her concepts and, and her inspirations and her choreography. And I'm very much the same way. I'm very Joseph Campbell like mm. in that sense. And that as I look for those universal themes of the hero with a thousand faces, I work in that type of thinking. And my mom was very, very influential on that front. So I've got these heroes in theater that are really, really critical. And of course that, you know, goes into opera and ballet as well. It's like, you know, so Puccini is probably my favorite opera composer, Puccini and Mozart, mm -hmm. definitely. And then, you know, I grew up with these incredible ballet scores in my ears um, of Tchaikovsky and Stravinsky and Prokofiev. And uh, so that was just, I just was really saturated 
from both sides of my family. And so, okay, so also I'm, you know, from Oklahoma, we have 39 federally recognized tribes here. And so, you know, I spend a lot of time traveling with dad and, and just being in Oklahoma, I mean, we just, everybody knows each other. And so, um, I just grew up in a, in a, an environment that was very intertribal. Mm. So I feel very fortunate knowing so many different tribes as a kid and being very comfortable meeting people. And I love it. I love meeting folks from different tribes that I haven't met before and learning music and whatever it is. And, and so I just, I just have this in, enthusiasm of meeting folks, you know, from Indian country that was very instilled from my father. And on, on top of that, my, my grandmother um, also was, I, I got to know my grandmother uh, for, she, she lived 101 years. And so I was very fortunate in my forties, my grandmother was one of my best friends and grandmother went to the Shilako Indian school here in Oklahoma. And grandmother, because of that also got to know um, many different uh, natives from different tribes around the country as well. So she had like a, a native cosmopolitan experience herself. So with dad and grandmother in my life, I uh, had a tremendous impact of how I feel as an American Indian. Mm -hmm. I'm very proud. I love being Indian and I see so much possibility. And I just, to me, it's, I have a very colorful life as an American Indian and I really, really love it. I enjoy that. I'm very, very proud of who I am. Mm -hmm. And that came very, very strongly from my dad and my grandmother. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What a rich history. <laughs> oh my goodness. No, it's amazing. It really is. You know, I'll tell you, I mean, I couldn't have articulated this 30 years ago. There's just no way. I mean, it's, it's, you know, as in my midlife, I'm, I'm able to now really look at the summary of my experiences and go, Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> this is just phenomenal. Yeah. And I also believe that I'm not unique in that sense. I really believe that every person on this planet has an incredible combination of experiences in their lives that makes them very, very unique. And so, I mean, like there's 8 billion people on this planet, which means there's 8 billion beautiful lived lives that have incredible experiences. And, you know, every single person is truly a universe within themselves mm. of feelings, experiences, knowledge, backgrounds, all kinds of things, you know, perspectives. And so I see that in every person that I meet as well. Yeah, we definitely are our own unique, like thumbprint. Yes. Yeah. Uni universe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's big. You think about it. I mean, it's like what everybody's experiences are incredibly detailed and complex. Yeah. And I respect that. I think that's wonderful. I think it's absolutely sensational that people have that. So, I mean, you know, you and I could just cut, we could talk for months and never be done. <laughs> Oh, for sure. Yeah. And that's just two people. You know, that's <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Sharing experiences and all of that. Yeah, you're right. Especially me. I, my mom refers to me as her talker. <laughs> <laughs> she won't even refer to me as someone in the grocery store like, oh, you know, Jane, I'd like you to meet my daughter, Heidi. No, no, no. Here's my daughter, the talker. <laughs> so <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> but all of that, I mean, just think about, you know, your mother's side and your father's side, your grandmother's side, and how it was just like this big old melting pot for you, where you got to experience the dance element and the music element and, you know, your culture and look at what you're doing now. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I was watching some of your YouTube interviews, which were so well done. And you describing yourself as a Chickasaw classical composer, yes. right? Yeah. Yes. And you can hear that in your music. Thank you. Yeah. No, it's amazing the use of the percussive instruments and even specifically like your flute concerto, right? And just the way that the flute transcends and has this hollowness, the different rhythms you utilize, and I could go on and on. But all of that, from what I'm hearing, is that that background that your grandparents and your parents gave you really laid a beautiful foundation for your music making. Yes. Yep. yep, I totally agree. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. But no, there's so many different elements to what you just said that I completely resonate with, especially the dance element. Um, before I was a flutist, I was a ballerina. And oh, okay. yeah, and so it's so crazy. You're right. Like all of those influences really impact you later as an adult. Not that they don't impact you in the moment, but like you said, 
I would not have been able to communicate those ideas 30 years ago. And I feel the same way. I mean, when Eric and I share different things about life or whatever, and I share things with my students in the flute studio, I notice that I am inspired and I pull different elements out from my dance, you know, history yep. into the flute studio. Yep. Yep. And I mean, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of flutists out there who were at some point a dancer, but that's a very unique thing that, you know, I can bring to my students. And mm -hmm. so I'm sure you find the same to be true in your world. Absolutely. I mean, you know, as a as a composer, I'm very theatrically influenced. Mm. And I believe that the composers that have really stayed in history are the ones who have a very theatric sense of themselves. Hmm. And, you know, I mean, honestly, to me, that's a very positive diva thing. Okay. That's, that's a very positive, strong ego. It's for a beautiful reason. Hmm. And so I encourage people to nurture that part of their diva-ness and their ego because that's their deepest creativity. And that's when life really, really shines is when, is when we fuel that part of our ego. Yeah. So, so just, uh, you know, the, the, world of, the world of dance – well, okay. So, if, I mean, if you look at, I mean, somebody like Beethoven who could barely dance himself, I don't even think he took any classes or anything like that. <laughs> I think, and, and I, th I think the reason he resonates so deeply is because of, of his theatric sense, his dramatic sense. Mm. It's, it's unmistakable. Mm. And it's the same thing. It's like when you listen to Debussy, his evocativeness, I mean, his emotions are so significant and, and his, his ability to go between something very, very subtle and something very, very overwhelming is really marked. I mean, it's, it's incredible. And Prokofiev is another composer like that, that I, I think is really tapped into um, his, his whole, his, his theater of himself. And so anyway, so I'm, I'm personally attracted to that kind of artistic um, uh, making hmm. of anything is I, I like to feel dramatic somehow just i don't know it's, it's, it's some it, to me it's like about a theatric delivery mm. whether it's very subtle and soft or where it's very larger than life there's something there's always something very dramatic so, so like for instance like if okay if somebody's a, a really good storyteller does not have to be really really loud and so if if somebody comes up to you and you're you're sitting and you're in a very quiet conversation and if I'm talking to you and I put my hand on your wrist, you know, to kind of brace things and I look at you and I say, listen, there's something very, very important that I need to discuss with you. And this is going to take a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. I've got you. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of art and music that I like to listen to. And I like to create is the kind that no matter what, there's this intensity, this of intent is it's like, it's like, it's so important that I got to say this mm. and, and it, you know, and so, and that can be in any possible style of music, but there's that, that, that spirit of, of urgency to tell what I'm, what somebody's telling comes across. Mm. I'm very attracted to that. And yeah. I, I feel like, you know, I feel like stories in general are like that. So, you know, I, I'm very biased, of course, you know, because, you know, I'm, I'm native. And so I, I really loved native stories. And I, I read my son, stories from all kinds of tribes all the time. And, and I, it's because I feel that, and I want him to have that sense of all, all across Indian country of this just really focused. There's something very important about this story. Mm. And I'm not sure I can put my, you know, my finger on it, but I got to tell you this story. So that, that's just the kind of, that that's kind of how I think about being an artist. No, I love that. Oh, goosebumps. Seriously. <laughs> no, you're not just saying something to say it. Mm -hmm. But there's that urgency and this need, passion. Yep. You have to be fulfilled. I mean, you just need to get it out there and, and not just say it, but say it with conviction. Yeah. 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 And, you know, and of course, you know, I can't do that alone. I need to be able, it's, it's, a, it's a relationship. I need to be able to express that to some individual or a group of people to feel whole. Hmm. No, I love that. And especially as a composer then, you know, those collaborations with the musicians, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the ensemble or the soloist or the conductor, right? It's this collaboration and you need others to bring it to life. You know, it's it's really funny because as, um, as a composer, you know, it's really critical that I have um, solitude when I'm creating 
But that solitude is feel filled. Sorry, that solitude is fueled with the anticipation of relationship. Huh? Yeah. No, I love that. Mm-hmm. So you're- yeah, yeah, because I mean, right. So when I'm writing, I'm completely imagining in real life the relationship with that musician playing the piece and me having a discussion with about it. And I'll, I'll, everything that happens as a result of writing it, I'm I'm there. I'm anticipating. Hmm that whole relationship. Mm. So I'm not alone. Yeah. Yeah. I love so, that. <laughs> it's, it's a funky little thing. Cause like I said, it requires solitude and isolation, but it's anticipatory isolation. <laughs> <laughs> no, from a, per, uh, from a performer's perspective, that gives me a lot of peace and grounding almost because when we're in the practice room, Right, that's solitary work, mm-hmm. yeah. right? But then, yeah, it's the same thing. Mm-hmm. yeah. But then, what you're saying is, if I'm playing one of your pieces or anybody's piece, I can almost then imagine that that composer is in the room with me, yes, because he or she was anticipating that union and that magic to happen, and yeah. then later that magic continues when you get to share it with another human experience, the audience, mm-hmm. you know from the stage and then it's grown even more. I love that. And I, uh, there was something that, that really influenced me w- with my first piano teacher at Northwestern. He and I would jointly talk about composers um, uh, in the now, like Beethoven is not was, I never, I never, I never used the word was in my lessons. We talked about now in the present and as time has gone on, I feel m- more and more conviction about the fact that I just don't feel like time or space really exists. Hmm. And so, so like, and I'm, this, this harkens back to what you're saying. That is the composer is there. Hmm. Absolutely. And, the, and, and I just believe that any composer that's, that's been alive and I are really in the exact same space. It's like, so I could sit down with any given composer and talk about parenting and we'd just be laughing and rolling our eyes and this kind of thing. And it would be the exact same thing. And the same thing about, you know, what to, you know, deadlines and all kinds of practical things about bills. Those types of think conversations would be absolutely the same across the board, no matter what time you live in. Yeah. So, so, and also because of that, I, uh, composers to me are all modern composers, no matter what, when, or when it's going to be composed, it's all modern music. Hmm. And so I just don't treat, it, it requires the exact same musicianship as anything else. So it doesn't matter what era of music you're playing, it requires the same musicianship and commitment. And that to me takes a sense of feeling that that composer is still alive and right with you hmm. all the time. So it's the same thing. You know, it's like, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. There's something about that, I think, as performing artists is that we're constantly living in multiple times and spaces hmm. at the same time. We're, yeah. con- we're conscious of that all of the time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like a time capsule. Or Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I just like I said, I just don't think I just don't think time and space exists. So I'm like, like you and I are like on online. Talk, I mean, you, we could be you could be on Saturn. <laughs> and it wouldn't make any difference to me. Or you could be right across the street and we'd still be doing the studio recording. Mm. Either way, I, I feel like, you know, that y'all are just my next door neighbors. Yeah. That's just how I feel about it. Mm. And and also, you know, no matter which one of us passes first, we're still always going to be alive. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I love that. No, it makes a lot of sense to me. Mm-hmm. And I've actually been thinking about this idea when I was talking with uh, the flute professor through Peabody, Marina mm-hmm. Piccinini. And mm-hmm. when I got to talk with her, she did the same thing. She wasn't referring to Mozart. Like she adores Mozart and she was elaborating on, on his music. And she was talking about him in our conversation as if he was still alive. I mm-hmm. mean, literally it gave me goosebumps because she repeatedly say like, oh, I'm in relationship with him. And Mm -hmm. what is he saying through the page? And what is he telling me? And it almost just felt like she was talking about her dad or (laughs) her brother Mm -hmm. or do you know what I mean? And so it's interesting to see this come full circle for me and this idea and this concept come up again. So yeah, thank you for sharing that. 
Oh yeah, yeah. That, that's I'm really glad you told me about that about her talking about that too because I'm I'm not really sure how everybody else sees it, but but yeah, I mean we are we're in constant relationship with each other. We're we're colleagues. We're all in the same era. You know, we're doing the same thing. We're all making music. And we're all practicing. We're all self critical. We're all trying. We have no idea where we fit. <laughs> exactly. You know, like in the t- in the whole. And so no, nobody can predict that. I mean, that's something Martha Graham said, you know, really clearly. She said, it's not your job as an artist to predict your place in history. It's just your job to do the be the best artist you can be. And that's that's the best you can do. And so you never know how it's going to come out in the wash. Exactly. Um and so I, I just think that, you know, to see it kind of humbly like that also gets, it just brings you closer to everybody, mm. you know? I mean, yeah, she is in a relationship with Mozart. That's why he put, and that, that's what he wanted too. Like when he was writing this stuff, he, you know, he, he was, he was anticipating people, generations, like multiple generations after him playing his music, hmm. you know? And so it's like, that's why it's like time doesn't exist. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's yeah. amazing. So that qu- <laughs> <laughs> no, what the the quote from Martha Graham it reminded me of focusing on the process rather than the results. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Focusing on your growth uh-huh. is good, and you know that that's great for life anyway. I mean, that's what I'm trying to teach my son. My son's seven, and so I'm trying to you know teach him. It's about growth, dude. You know, it's like look, you got to make these mistakes. The mistakes are really, really important to your growth. They're like essential. Mm-hmm. You know, he's and he, you know, he's just starting to, you know, I'm just speaking that language to him right now. And, and so, you know, yeah. Well, I wish I would have had you as a parent because <laughs> it was <laughs> it was geared towards the other way of you better not make a mistake. And yeah. I'm having to shed some of those, you know, false statements, yeah. you know, even as an adult, I'm like, no, I'm allowed to make a mistake. And <laughs> Um, cause that's how you grow. You know, there's just no way around it. Yeah. It's, it's critical. It's, it's necessary. Yeah. Mistakes are absolutely critical. Yeah. Oh my goodness. That's a lot to digest, <laughs> but I love it. I'm trying to find a beautiful segue into talking about your compositions and what you want people to know about your works. So basically uh, just kind of, I'll take you through the, to the story. And that is, you know, it was, it was, my father played piano repertoire in the house and sang all the time. And so I, I grew up with that sound and it wasn't until I was about eight that I said to dad, I said, Hey, I'd, I'd really like to start taking piano lessons. So he and mom worked that out. And I'm, and so within three months I had announced to my parents that I was to be a concert pianist. So that was that. And so I just, was always a pianist since then. I knew I wanted to be a piano player. And so by the time I was a sophomore in high school is when I started to realize, okay, you know, great. Yeah, I've got talent, but I, I've got to really, really focus on how I'm practicing. And so I did. In high school, I picked up the pace. I also picked up my grades. I just started getting really serious <laughs> about it because I knew what it was going to take. The summer before my senior year in high school, I went out to Chicago. My 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 uncle, my, my mother's side, was a jazz drummer in Chicago um, since the early 70s. And so I went out and stayed with, with Jerry and I went to Northwestern and studied with Don Isaac for a month just to check it out. Hmm. And it turned out he was an amazing mentor. And that's where I went to my for undergraduate. So I'm really fortunate. I was accepted to Oberlin, Northwestern, Indiana University, New England Conservatory, um, all with full rides to all of those. And so my work was definitely paying off. And so I went to Northwestern. And I mean, I just was, you know, practicing, practicing, was just playing the piano. I had a lot to catch up on. Mm-hmm. And um, so while that's all going on, my mother, you know, is a professional choreographer and dancer. She was teaching at the University of Wyoming. And she was the one that set, you know, like Rite of Spring, Petrushka, Firebird on her students. And so that, that's how I got to know that repertoire very well. Mm-hmm. So she was doing original ballets and wanted to do an, an original ballet based on American Indian stories from the Northern Plains and Rockies where she was. And so she just really casually said, well, I, you know, Jared, I really like you. You're my Indian kid, classical pianist. I'd like you to write the score. And I was like, okay. So <laughs> that right there was a very pivotal moment. I, she shocked me beyond belief when she asked me that because, and I told her, no, I said, are you crazy? I can't write a ballet score. Well, I mean, I was, I was like, like almost angry with her for even suggesting that I could do. And she, she was kind of like, dude, what's your problem? <laughs> and so, you know, I mean, and here I'm, here I'm being raised, you know, by in dance history of all these entrepreneur choreographers. Well, that's what dancers do. Hmm. You know, they choreograph and they dance. Well, 
Okay, back in the 80s, I will say, I will say this. I was in an environment of classical music in which things were much more compartmentalized than they are now with millennials. Millennials have really broken that back into, into an entrepreneurship type of an attitude, which I'm very grateful for. Hmm. Uh, because that's what Beethoven was. He was yep. a pianist and he was a teacher and he was a composer and he was a conductor. And he also, you know, was an adoptive parent to his you know, nephew, Carl, that, I mean, you know, the guy was like everything. Mm. And so, and he didn't go to college. I mean, nobody did back then. So, I mean, we weren't institutionalized as much and things weren't as formalized. And so in the eighties, it was like really entrenched. You were either going to be a university professor or you're going to be a world famous concert pianist, or you're going to be a, uh, an accompanist or a studio teacher. You know what I mean? It's like, mm-hmm. it was really, things were much more rigid, I guess. And so I was kind of in that mindset and I just didn't see myself as like a a total musician on that front. And so, um, but so that was that part, but also, um, mom was suggesting, uh, that I be, be my entire self. Hmm. And that had never occurred to me once in my life that my identity as a Chickasaw man and a classical musician had anything to do with each other. Wow. Yeah. And so it was brilliant. So, I mean, she just, she just really opened up a floodgate in my life and it was very overwhelming to me. Well, also I happen to be a very A type personality who takes things very seriously (laughs) and I make decisions with a lot of consideration first, like I did when I announced to my parents, I was to be a pianist and that Mm -hmm. stuck with it. I was very committed. So, um, I, I have that, that's a very strong part of my personality. And so I went, was, you know, practicing Brahms and WC and, and I, and I was getting ready for my own stuff. And so I was practicing and I, it just started coming to me and I started writing things down and I came to mom a week later and I said, I've got some music hmm. and she goes, okay. So we, I played it for her and uh, I had about seven minutes written and we, and so we decided we we're going to do the embark on this. And so my, I started composing that the year that I was um, working as a staff pianist um, at Northwestern university and then I finished it when I was at the Cleveland Institute of Music and then took some time off because we eventually um, toured the production. I mean, we premiered it and toured it. So basically, mom gave me my first opportunity to be my entire self as, as an American Indian and a classical musician. And um, that's that changed my life forever. And so uh, in the process – uh, you know, okay, okay. So here I was going. You know, geez. I mean, I grew up with the, grew up with this great ballet repertoire, and I was just, you know, I, there's two things on on my shoulders. Number one is, is like I wanted to make sure that that what I was doing as an Indian composer was good. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't want it to be, you know, any token thing or kitschy or gimmicky or anything. Yeah. I just didn't want that. Yeah. And 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 I was, you know, and here I was honestly, I was, you know, the eighties was full of new age music. And so you had, you know, pianists that were all new age and there was a lot of criticism flying from me as well. And so here I was now in my own crosshairs, hmm. <laughs> you know, look and so but at the same time it's like, well my gosh, you know, and here's all these great ballet scores by Tchaikovsky. I'm like, I I, I was just overwhelmed. I felt a lot of pressure and I felt a lot of obligation to to you know do it right hmm. which is good that's i mean that's what all artists you know that's what everybody should do is and, and we need to put ourselves within our own positive pressure and so um but also uh in the process uh when we did the ballet we hired a narrator because mom wanted a storyteller in there and we and we just looked up the cast from dances with wolves and called rodney grant and because dances with wolves had just come out yeah and and so it was all the it was all the 1492 celebration stuff and so there's the same year that the ballet came out was 1992 and so we were in the middle of all that and so rodney was this very at, at that time, very famous actor who was called wind in his hair and he was just awesome. And, you know, his hair was, his hair was down to his ankles and stuff like that. And and so we called him and asked me if he do it. And he accepted the gig and the guy came in just like a thunderstorm into my life. Mm. And he was just very intent. He was like, Jared, this is really, really critical that you're doing this. You got to do this mm. and you've got to see your, and he was like telling you, you got to see yourself as very important. Very. And I was just like, I, uh, I don't, Oh, I, I, I don't know. I didn't know what to think about my own, my own self. Hmm. And so anyway, and then, um, within the classical community, I, after I was done with the ballet, I had the same response. People were just like, uh, you've got something going here. <laughs> and so, uh, so it still, I still, after the ballet, I hadn't, I wasn't decided. And so, um, I spent time thinking about it. And so then what I did is I went to Cleveland, I went back and I added composition to my degree and I announced to my family that I was, to be 
a Chickasaw classical composer. Mm. And so the irony is this, is that here I was struggling with this issue, and yet the repertoire I was playing was Bartok and Debussy uh. and Prokofiev and Beethoven, all and of course all the all the operatic and ballet repertoire and musical theater, all this stuff is so saturated in national and ethnic identity. It's just <laughs> unbelievable. You couldn't be any more French than Claude Debussy. You right. couldn't be any more Russian than Tchaikovsky. Yeah. You couldn't, you know. I mean, it's just and and uh, you couldn't be any more German than Beethoven. You cannot get more German than Beethoven. Yeah. it's impossible. Yeah, and so these were very very specific. And Bartok, of course, became the the first ethnomusicologist of his own people. The mm. first composer to like be a deliberate ethnomusicologist of his own folk music. Mm. So here I was completely being trained in the repertoire <laughs> that I was playing. And so not only in that issue of ethnicity, but also just as a composer, I was playing the best. If you learn the Volstein Piano Sonata, you know everything there is about architecture and composition. Mm. It's just, I mean, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, so here I was being heavily equipped just in all kinds of fronts. And then, you know, mom opened this door and, pull, and I, it just, there it was. Wow. I wonder why there was this disconnect for you in the early stages of not embracing that traditional side? Well, it's not that I wasn't embracing it. I just, I just didn't see a relationship between those two aspects of my life. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's almost like not seeing any relationship between my left and right arm. It's like, well, I got these two arms, but they act very individually. Oh, wow. I can pick (laughs) up something together. with. I say that, you know, a little, a little self-deprecating because it's like, Jared, duh, man. I mean, come on, you were, (laughs) <laughs> yeah yeah but I, I i just didn't i just for some reason i just didn't make that connection mm. no that's interesting and mm. what a wonderful testimony to your mother <laughs> yeah. you know yeah 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 and then of course you know here now it's like that's all dad and i talk about huh. you know it's like the the two and, and it was it was they were also um a part i mean two very strong parts of his identity as well um and so I don't know. I mean, you know, it's I don't see this as a, necessarily a positive or negative thing at all. I mean, Dad was also totally classically trained, and he was Chickasaw, but it was they were just and I'm, okay. I'm this and that. And so being a composer is where I'm making a, a deliberate move to make them the same thing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I bet. Well, you tell me because I don't want to put words in your mouth. But it sounds like you're more fulfilled in the sense that you get to embrace and put the two together rather than, I mean, yeah. right? Well, yes. Yeah. Because they, they flow very easily one into, in, in, in my world, in my universe that I, that I live in, they're just all, it's all spherical. It's like all at once, mm. all the time. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, I feel complete. Yeah. No, I love that. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll be honest with you. That's I, when I teach and when I talk to other people, I have, I have a lot of enthusiasm and high energy for it because I hope that other people find themselves complete. Also, Mm -hmm. I wish this feeling for other people. Yep. Mm -hmm. Completely. And you caught me in a season in my life where I am embracing that for me. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I received a terminal degree in flute performance and you're told that you get an (laughs) academic job. You get a, do you know what I mean? You get a full time. The red carpet just comes right out. Yeah. Yeah. Right. (laughs) But what happens when there aren't any jobs out there? You know what I mean? For a full time tenure track position in flute. There's like maybe one or two these last three years and that's it. Do you know how many amazing flutists are out there with the DMA? I do. Tons. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm aware. Oh, yeah, a lot. (laughs) And so life, you know, especially with COVID, like asked me to pivot and to embrace like everything that I have to offer this world in my very unique way. And I've learned I can still be an educator. And if there's not this fancy title from some school saying, oh, now you can teach doesn't mean that I can't teach. <laughs> Do you right. know what I mean? And so, so much of what your journey and how you explain that so beautifully is exactly like this moment in time where I am embracing oh. those different sides and saying, oh, 
I'm actually yeah. a really good administrator. I'm also a really good creative coming up with different uh, products or different teaching guides or yeah. classes or do you know what I mean? And it's like, wow, I'm yeah. actually more in my element being my own entrepreneur through, Your own boss. Yep. yeah, I'm actually more me. I'm actually more Heidi than trying to cram me into maybe a position that I thought I had to have. That's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. And just embracing that and just, and then giving yourself that freedom to say, this is not how I anticipated it, <laughs> but yeah. I'm actually glad that life threw me all these different curveballs for me to just realize and come back to myself and and who I am and what I have to offer and almost embracing it to a point where it's accepting it rather than fighting. Right. Does that resonate? Very much. Okay. Very yeah. much. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I learned to find the joy in all of my superpowers and not worry about if I, if I did not worry about anything else, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and, and the thing is, I don't want to be like another artist, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I think that when I think it's, I think it's very normal, um, in anybody's profession when they're trying to become good at what they're doing is to model themselves and, and aspire. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's critical. Um, and then there becomes a point to where, uh, you, you're leaving the dock yeah. and it's time. <laughs> it's time to leave the dock and see what you've got in your in your ship. Yeah, and and to really really enjoy that, and I I think that is the journey of every single living person. Mm -hmm. I think it's 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 challenging, it's scary, and it's beautiful at the same time. If we were all exactly the same, it would just be not not fun. It wouldn't be. Yeah, it'd just be boring. You know? Yeah, and you're right. There is this beauty element, and also a very scary element too. <laughs> I yeah. get that, but. That's the magic, right? It's mm, actually like it's, kind of, I don't want to say jumping off the cliff, but, you know, having that faith and saying, okay, this doesn't feel, this is crazy that I'm doing this or I'm pursuing this. But at the same time, that's where I'm being redundant. But literally, that's where the magic happens is when you get to explore uncharted territories. You know, at the same time, that also does take a certain mindset. That's the part that we're all individually responsible for is to is to have a mindset that's like, all right, there's opportunity here. I've, yeah. I've, there are silver linings and I just need to breathe and really just kind of be open to that so that they can present themselves. Because what happens is we get caught in our own static in our minds hmm. and, it, and it blocks out our ability to see yep. things that could be sitting right in front of us. So if we can take time to be still and to think, just breathe through it, those things do emerge and very consistently. Hmm. They really do. Yep. Oh, my gosh. I think you are living inside my head. <laughs> because... <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, I love it. No, this is so good. It's just validation for me. Like, these are the thoughts I've been having lately since basically July 2020. And mm. it, it was, uh, you know, having a job loss. I had a job signed up for Shanghai, China for the next two years. And then COVID mm. had other plans and yes. it forced me to reinvent myself. And it was scary. And, but at the same time, it was so liberating. It was like, mm. Oh my gosh, why did I not do this sooner? Do you yeah. know? And so yeah. it's interesting to see where our conversation led. And, but it's so encouraging to hear this from somebody who's a professional in his field and so well versatile experienced and just to thank you for showcasing that because I think more musicians need to hear this message. Oh, well you're welcome. And I, I, I agree. And I love sharing that because mm. I, I know it to be true. Mm. And I also know that it's liberating. Mm. And, and again, I wish, I wish that for my colleagues, my human colleagues, I, I wish happiness for everybody. And, uh, you know, there's, there's as many ways to live a life as there are people on the planet. There are many, as many seats to sit in hmm. as there are people on the planet. There's not a limited amount of seats. Hmm. And, uh, and, and that's true. That is an absolute fact. That's not a belief. That's the truth. Hmm. So I, I think the more we talk about it is really, really important because hmm. look, I mean, I, there were people that told me that, that I, that I had to go, all right, is that true? You know, but I had to hear it. Hmm. 
you know, from somebody. That's that's why, of course, that's, that gets into like you know why humans are meant for each other. We're we're here to be for here each, for each other, mm-hmm. and th- that's the kind you know. And we benefit from each other all the time when we listen to each other and each other's genuine experiences. And so when we have, have an and a mindset of like, hey, we're all in this together. You know, rising tide raises all ships type of thing. I, I think then a lot of beauty can happen with that. So, yeah. So I. I, I feel the same way. I've, I'm, I'm equally inspired by the mentors and the people that have crossed my life. And, and I'm very grateful to them for saying the things that they've had. Well, I'll tell you one thing that was really important is I, you know, and I, I remember these again at, at my age, I'm starting to take inventory of some things. They're like, wow, <laughs> well, my, my piano teacher at Northwestern. Okay. So I just, I, obviously I'm a very gregarious person and I have this. So in my lessons, every once in a while, I have my teacher, I'd be like, all right, okay. Cause I try to do all these things. And I was just like, ah, so I'd be, I'd, I'd have him sit down and say, could you just show me, could you demonstrate more? Just, just sit down here and, and let me watch. Mm. And he'd talk through things. This and, and so I remember we were talking, I was asking all these questions and he just stopped mm. and he looked at me just with this very intense look on his face. I'll never forget. And he said, Jared, you're going to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, there's one thing I need you to think about. He said, you need to have a long vision. And he said, you need to be thinking 20 years ahead. Mm. And I just looked at him and I just thought, is that good or bad? Yeah. And, and I, could, I wasn't sure, but, at the, but it didn't matter because he was just like, he believed in me. Hmm. And he was like, you need to think long term. This can be a long one. And I think there was a lot in that. Number one is I had a lot to learn, like everybody does. But also, I think he was telling me that because he really thought that if I stick with it, that I was going to be good. I was going to be okay. Or I was, I was going to figure out what I need to figure out. I mean, so, um, and I tell my son that now I'm like, I think of you in 20 years. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that when, if we can, again, and okay. So for instance, you're talking about COVID we may as well talk about that. Well, I mean, this, this crashed literally one year ago, but almost to the day yeah. here in, yeah. in, in my life is when all this came down, I had just gigged with San Francisco and Dallas and, Buffalo. And I was really lucky to get those in before this happened. And I rem- I'll never forget sitting right at this desk, minus this microphone and, um, and looking at my computer screen and having pending invoices and just thinking to myself, hmm. okay, take inventory. Hmm. Where are you, what do you have in the bank? Hmm. How many months can you live like this? Hmm. Now you got that much time to figure it out. Hmm. Do you have any answers now? No. Do you need them now? No. Okay. I just, I just took myself through this and I was like, all right, one day at a time hmm. is how I'm, I'm going to do this. And I thought I've been in worse financial straits. Boy, my twenties were horrible. I mean, I, I was, I, I, had, I slept on park benches in New York city. I, I slept, oh. you know, in, in uh, rest areas when I was traveling sometimes. This, this was real. I, I had oh real gosh. poverty in my life. Well, Hey, you know, I'm not alone. There's a lot of people who've done this. And, and so I'm like, no, I'm, I'm much, I, I had now have much more, you know, ability, skill sets, let's put it that way, you know, in my life. And I'm like, okay, so I just remember saying, all right, today I'm not going to have the answers, but today I'm going to be open. I'm going to open myself to the answers mm-hmm. and tomorrow, probably something will occur to me. And lo and behold, it did. And so then the next time I'm like, all right, just keep this. And, and I just like it. And then, and then basically then I also realized just for myself, I had really had to f- have a positive attitude mm-hmm. and look for silver linings and also know this, there's a couple things here. Well, this, this pulls into my Indian ancestry. My, you know, my, my ancestors walked, you know, 800 miles in mud mm-hmm. um, so that I didn't have to do that. Yeah. They did that. I don't, I can still drive a car and fly airplanes. I mean, so I'm like, all right, I've got to, you know, <laughs> there's one thing, <laughs> you know, I, I don't have to do that. And that, and, and so I just started to take, you know, just evaluate the blessings I have in my life. And because that, those are tools to cultivate, you know, what we've got going for us and go, all right, now how I, how can I build my new structure out of this? And so, and everybody was faced with this challenge. And so, I, you know, so when I, when I see my, my own assets and I see that my life has a unique experience that has lots of value to it, mm-hmm. then that's when, that's when people can build from the ground. That's how you can rise from the ashes, that kind of a thing. And it's, that's a typical hero story. Mm-hmm. We watch movies about this all the time. Yep. 
you know, for a reason is because we're looking for this type of inspiration. Well, here it was in living color, hmm. you know, there it goes. So anyway, that, that's just, that's where, that's where I was coming from. And so as soon as, and I mean, look, I was already zooming. And so when zoom came in, I was thrilled because <laughs> suddenly I was like seeing 30 people at once. I'm like, woo, this is awesome. And I don't have to fly across the country to do it. I mean, I didn't have to try. I thought it was great. I didn't have to travel anymore because I was traveling once or twice a month and I, you know, the recovery and getting ready is, I mean, man, it's just, it's exhausting. So suddenly everybody's at my, at my desk. I'm like, this is so cool. And I just, it just occurred to me. I'm like, you know what? We're living the Gene Roddenberry dream. Mm. This is a Star Trek screen I'm looking at <laughs> video conferencing across the galaxy. And I was thinking, you know, the thing is, it's like, and here we had this delay and all that kind of stuff. I'm like, this is going to tighten up. And of course, Zoom has tightened that up. And so is Skype. Everybody's tightened all this up. And so what's going to happen is like, well, you know, there's only about a one second delay from the moon at this point on regular radio yeah. waves. Yeah. Well, we're going to be doing all this to the moon. We're going to have, we're going to be collaborating artistically with people on the moon. And so then what's going to happen is that we're going to find some kind of a quantum sinking, you know, from Mars so yep. that there's no delay mm. from Mars. That's going to happen. Yep. So I'm just like, you know what? We are now all being thrust into the future of the technology that we already have. Yep. And when that, I mean, when, uh, when I started to see, just see things like this, I started to get really excited. And I got to be honest with you, I am thrilled hmm. for our future. I think what's, I mean, we, we have been thrust into techniques that are so fabulous, hmm. you know, and it's not just for recreation anymore. It's not like, you know, it's, it's, it's like, we're really trying to get things done. And this new tool is fabulous. I'll tell you one story that this really great. I had happened to be commissioned by White Snake Opera Company in Boston and for a new song. They they had actually commissioned eight different composers for different songs. And we're talking like songs that were either musical theaters or opera, you know, like uh, it was open to the, all that writing songs. And so um, I was asked to write a song um, <clears throat> and it was, it was based, actually focused on colonization, this kind of thing. And so I came up with this concept that that's cool. So we're doing this and we had a scheduled performance in that last April. Uh, in Boston, and I was planning on going, all this kind of stuff, and the and pandemic hit. I mean, all the music had been submitted, and this hit, and it was canceled. This was one of the first things that was canceled. Well, Cerise Jacobs, the, the executive director of the opera company, said, all right, guys, hmm. we got Zoom. We're doing this. And she just, I mean, within hours, wow. she was on this. And she got started doing her tech research, finding people, blah, blah, blah. And I mean, at this point, nobody had done, you know, full-length concerts on Zoom. Mm -hmm. It was it was all you know convention stuff and 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 it was janky then and people are always apologetic that was every everybody was apologetic for having to zoom yeah and so now it's expected yeah and and cherished almost it's like now I'm like I love seeing people it's like it's it's now part of our vernacular so um, mm -hmm. anyway so we did this so we did this whole thing and she wanted it to where the audience could open up unmute themselves and we could hear mm -hmm. three hundred people clapping at once and mm -hmm. she did it. Hmm. She absolutely did it. And then the second year, the second round, I was asked to do another song knowing it was going to be that concert. Okay. Just, just like that. And so now everybody was – so she pre-recorded the pianist and cello and then had the singer sing with it for the first concert. This time it was streamed with all three, and it was just like all this stuff. And I'll tell you right there, and then I was on the forefront of, of conquering this technology and, and having a part of my – and now I'm thrilled. I'm just hmm. so thrilled to have been a part of that. What a blessing. Yeah. That was incredible. And I mean, now I like, I'm really wanting new, I want it, I want this to happen more. I just, I'm just in that mindset. I just really, really love what we're able to do. And now, okay, I was already like all in YouTube and subscribing to all kinds of stuff and podcasts. Well, now we can podcast concerts, YouTube and concerts. And there's so many orchestras who leaned into the technology yep. and I'll tell you their production is really impressive. A lot, what a lot of folks are doing and it really shook the trees. Yeah. And, and now I'm seeing all kinds of ensembles I would not have necessarily seen. Yep. And people, at different levels are embracing it. And it's just, I'm thrilled, absolutely thrilled to see this. Yeah. A whole new world of possibilities. Yeah. And now it's all of the above. So it's like a lot of people are like, Oh, post COVID where it's like, no, Hey, there's no post anything. Yeah. This is all part of the flow. This where, is the, it. And nothing ends and nothing is, you see what I mean? It's like, there's no time. It's like, this is mm. no, 
you know, the, the, if we see these cliffs of ending or beginning, it's like, then we're really limiting ourselves. But no, this is nothing's ending. Yeah. This was added. This was dropped into our existence. And now it's here forever. So yep. it's like, now I've just got this philosophy of all of the above. Absolutely. This yeah. is now part of our reality. And it doesn't, it, to me, it doesn't interfere at all. Yeah. With any, traditional whatsoever but that's also another thing that i've learned as an as an american indian is adaptation and co- i mean indians yep. are constantly adapting and and re we're constantly usurping hmm. and and appropriating things for ourselves in our own survival in and in our art in our fashion in our lifestyles i mean i come from a whole history of this that's very conscious of that mm. very conscious of that and so i'm just like hey this is just another iteration of it yeah you know? So anyway, that's the, I'm kind of blabbing on all that optimism, but I, I, I'm really I love this, and I also okay. One thing that's been very grieved in Indian country is you know ceremony gathering, like with stomp dancing or powwowing, that kind of thing. That's yeah. been hard, but at the same time, Indian country has really embraced each other through Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> I mean, it's like I see, I look at so much native art today on Instagram, and I love it. Nice. And I post videos of my own stuff constantly on there because I'm like, here. And and I would have I would have had the same enthusiasm to do that had I, had had we not had this. And I have got more native friends now because of this, and I've just mm-hmm. met so many more colleagues because we've been thrust into contacting each other online. Yeah. And so I'm really enjoying that right now. No, I love all of that. <laughs> Literally, I am soaking it in like a sponge. <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, I feel like I should pay you. No. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I, I'll tell you, I, yeah, I just, I do see a lot of silver linings. I really encourage all of our human colleagues to think about that, about, mm. the, about the silver linings. All of us have ancestors who worked very, very hard in much harder circumstances so that we could be where we are, all of us. There is every human on the planet is benefiting from the work of their own ancestors. And that's not exclusive to any ethnicity. Hmm. Everybody. Everybody yep. standing on the shoulders of the work of their ancestors. That's beautiful. Hmm. That is absolutely beautiful. And that that's why they did it. It's like what that's why I'm doing it. I want my son to have it better. Yeah. I want his. I, I want generations, you know, that I'll never see to have benefited from the work that I'm doing. I'm really hoping I'm making good decisions for that. You know, that's yep. and so we are now. And so I just, I, I think if we can tap into that awareness, it would be very, very helpful. Oh, for sure. And this this idea of just hearing you talk about silver linings and possibilities and not limiting ourselves. It just to me, the nugget that I'm pulling out from all of that is. Life is a continuation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So thank you for that. Sure. Hey, so about about the flute concerto, I'll, I'll give you some background on that. So yeah. um, when, when I wrote the flute concerto, I was, I you know, I had been a composition major at the Cleveland Institute of Music when I studied with Don Erb. My piano teacher was, was Elizabeth Pastor at CIM. Mm-hmm. And my composition teacher was Don Erb. Another, two other mentors that had a tremendous impact on me. One is, is that... Liz always sang as she played. Oh. Hmm. Hmm. And I mean, I just, I was in love with her artistically. I was in love with my mentor. I just loved her dearly. And she, and the, the fact that she would sing all the time while she's playing was very influential on me. And it got a little of the stuffy classicalness out of me. I was hmm. like, it, just, it loosened me up. It really did. And hmm. you know what? My son sings all the time and he sings to my music all the time, hmm. which is real. I, and I just love it. I'm, I look at him like, God, he just constantly sings. Well, anyway, that was, she had, and so it affected my tone on the piano and it Mm. really affected even more of my own expectations about how I was composing. Mm. And that is, I, I believe that there is a, a singing arc through music as well that we detect Mm. when a, when a composer feels a phrase that has an arc to it, there's like a spirit, like a spiritual singing of this gesture Mm. that happens and it could be a rhythmic entirely rhythmic it doesn't have to be a melody but it's just this feel that mm. you're singing from one phrase it's like you're speaking it's a, these phrasings had a tremendous impact on me and then um herb was himself very dramatic and gregarious bigger than life person and i felt permission 
to be myself with him. Hmm. And so, and just another big influence. So, okay. So I had left CIM. I didn't graduate. I actually didn't graduate till later on. I almost didn't get my master's degrees there. So that's, you're talking about getting a terminal degree. I'm like, oh, I was not a very good student. <laughs> and so anyway, I was in Denver, I believe at the time. And I got a call from uh, Christine Davis, who is the principal flutist of the Buffalo Philharmonic. Christine and I knew each other from CIM and she actually won the Buffalo Phil spot when she was a junior in college. Wow. And so, yeah. And so I, you know, I saw her just for a little bit and then she went off and then, um, she also was on my recording of my winter moons ballet that I, that I wrote for mom. Hmm. And actually that will be released, uh, probably either this fall or next spring. Cool. So, uh, but so Christine and I had worked together on that and we just knew each other. We're old friends. And so she called me out of the blue and said, I really want to um, commission a flute concerto from you. And I was like, hmm. oh, my gosh. <laughs> well, rewinding a little bit, my grandmother and I had not too long before that uh, taken our first my first trips back to our Chickasaw homeland in Mississippi. <laughs> and so the story of the Chickasaws is that we're from the southeast. We're part of a larger Muscogean culture of Chickasaws, Cherokees, Creeks, Choctaws. Uh, Seminoles. And th that's the Muscogean people. So um, we were all removed in the, the 1830s to Oklahoma. Hmm. And um, so, but that's, that's our homelands. My, my grandmother had been back and see, before we moved, we were like, we were like European empires at the time because we, yeah. we were colonized. We were immigrated to way before America was America. So w we, we were settled. Hmm. And so, and, and of course, you know, we were mixed with Irish and Scots. In fact, we had full blood Scots who were tribal leaders. Hmm. So they came in and assimilated with our tribes. That's how, that's our history. It's really interesting. And, um, uh, so we were like little empires, like European countries when we were moved over. So, uh, you know, we came with our own technology, but we were also very, very traditional, uh, people as well. So we were a mix, hmm. a very, very significant mix of of the world and being Chickasaw when we came over. So the reason I'm saying this because we parceled our land and sold it before we came over and then and then you know bought land tracks here. But th that allows us now I can go back and stand on the land parcels that my ancestors lived on knowing that's exactly where they lived. Hmm. By township and range I can find exactly where my ancestors walked. Wow specifically like in my exact family lineage. And so grandmother and I went back to Mississippi and spent a week out there together and she just showed me everything. Mm -hmm. And then we went back again. And so, uh, and I, I mean, of course it changed my life again. I mean, this is just incredible. And my dad told me, he said, you know, Jared, when you get there, he's like, you're, <laughs> you're going to understand why it was so hard to leave mm -hmm. because the nature is just unbelievable. The mm. trees, you know, it's like, you know, that in a return of the Jedi where the Ewoks live was like, in the, I think that was done the Redlands or something like that. <laughs> but the point, but the point is yeah. like, it's, it's just, I mean, the nature is so overwhelming and yeah. gorgeous. And yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's painful mm. to see that, but also illuminating and empowering at the same time. It's a lot. It's all the feelings okay. at the same time. And my grandmother and I, you know, we just talked. Oh, we talked and talked and talked. I just, she was another talker. We just constantly talked to each other. I was so fortunate. Driving and talking and, and walking, talking and just everything. And and we got home and I said, you will see a symphonic work out of this, mm -hmm. grandmother. Mm -hmm. That was the flute concerto, Tracing Mississippi. There's a trail mm -hmm. that goes through Mississippi from uh, – uh, Nashville, the Apple in the, into the Appalachians down to, um, uh, New Orleans called the Natchez trace. Okay. And very, very important trade route from the Gulf of Mexico up into the Appalachians. And, um, uh, lots of history goes straight through Chickasaw and Choctaw territory. And it's called the Natchez trace. And that's now a parkway that's beautiful and kept up very, very beautifully. And so, um, when I wrote this piece, you know, I loved the fact that here we got a flute, which is very much an icon of Indian country. Hmm. And um, I decided to uh, focus on a specific Garfish dance tune and just really li relive my experience and my feelings of being back in Mississippi. And so I just, it was kind of a play on word, but I, that's why I called it Tracing Mississippi. Hmm. It's like I'm tracing my own ancestry 
And there's, you know, there's, and my grandmother and I were literally doing that driving on the Natchez Trace together. And so that's, that's what that, that piece is very much a, a piece of my identity. Mm. Oh, how lovely. No, I'm so glad that you called it that too. Mm. Yeah. 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 So we pr- premiered that in 2001 with the Buffalo Philharmonic and then uh, recorded it with the San Francisco Symphony in 2007. Hmm. Very cool. I yeah. listened to a recording of my friend, actually, uh, Patricia Sermon. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's a recording on YouTube, and I listened yes. to that two days ago, and gorgeous, gorgeous. And um, I think she delivered it very well, too. She learned that in three weeks. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, she's that was unbelievable. <laughs> she said in the commentary, like the first couple minutes before the performance began, that she had a limited time of uh, learning it. So, yeah, mm-hmm. I noticed her stating that. <laughs> but no, it's yeah. How, have you met Patricia? Oh, yes. OK. Well, she was she was here. She was in Oklahoma at the time. OK. Oh, yeah. Teaching. So she- yeah, that's right. So she premiered, she played that with the Norman Philharmonic, and then she moved to Denver um, after that. And so, yeah, I've known Patricia ever that. That's how we met was was through that performance. Wow. Yep. Mm-hmm. Here's some more worlds colliding because Patricia is a good <laughs> friend of mine. <laughs> She's <Yeah>. awesome. <laughs> yeah. And her husband and her son. It's yep. uh, such a lovely family. Yes, yeah. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness. Is there anything else about the concerto that you want to share? I don't want to cut you off in any way. I'm not really sure what to say other than I just really, really went to town on that. I mean, Mm. the stars just aligned and I just really allowed myself um, to be entirely Jared in that piece. And that piece is definitely, um, what I want to say, it's Tate. That's Mm. Jared Mm. right there. Yeah, and, and if you hear any of my other music, I mean, you'll and if you heard that, you'd be like, "Yep, that's that's all Jared." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's there's no doubt about it. And so, you know, I just, I, you know, I wanted to, I, I, I treated it very much like a Bartok circumstance in which, I mean, I could show you in every measure theoretically what was going on, and it wasn't. It's not necessarily typical, you know, harmonies that were. I mean, it's not what we. It's not school theory. It's Jared theory. It's, and I can tell you, I could explain to you all the choices that I made pitch wise. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I just, I made it an academic study for myself Hmm. and an orchestration study for myself and then a theatric study for myself. Mm. It's continuous. It's, I mean, it's very, it's very theatric. I mean, Mm. entirely. I mean, it, it, it could be a ballet, Hmm. you know, if somebody decided to do that, I could, I could see that happening. Um, so anyway, I just I just really pulled out the stops, and and I remember you know my grandmother came to the premiere, um, and my my uh, but both my parents were there. My uh, I think was my brother there. I'm trying to remember exactly who came out, and so um, uh, I was able to share that with my family. That was kind of like my my explosion into it, and uh, my my dad still talks about it today. Hmm. He's like, that he just will never forget that experience. But my grandmother got to be there. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And I told her, cause she's like, I'll never forget. It. You promised me this was going to be a piece <laughs> of here. <heroism, laughs> you know? <laughs> so yeah. Oh, phenomenal. And I will say from my heritage is German being married to a native American man and somebody who loves all the cultures of the world. You know, my father was a missionary kid outside of Tokyo, Japan. My grandfather, my great grandfather translated the Bible from English to an African tribal language, you know? So that's what I'm about to say comes from that perspective and from my background. And thank you so much for putting your native voice onto the classical stage you know, there's so many flute concertos out there, but yours is so uniquely um, composed and sheds a beautiful light onto who you are as a composer, who your people are, the the geography of that part of the U.S. and everything. And I thank you for that because I think those unique voices and cultural backgrounds need to be celebrated more. Mm-hmm. And so... Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I said that because it's profound what you have added to our musical world and um, 
to the flutist, you know, and to our library and more so than just library. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. No, very, very appreciative of your work. And um, I'll, <laughs> I won't keep <laughs> blabbering, but I just wanted, I felt the need to to share that because maybe sometimes composers don't get that recognition as often. And so I just wanted to make sure that you knew that it was very well received. And thank you. we thank, thank you. you for that. Yeah. Well, you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, but yeah, no, that's amazing, Jared. And um, I thank you for your time. And I don't want to, is there, and this is such a general question, but I do this a lot just because I feel as a host, I never want to cut somebody off and be like, okay, and that's a wrap, you know? Uh, <laughs> and then you think, no, well, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's totally fine. You know, I mean, there, I mean, there's obviously all kinds of other things we could talk about. And so, you know, I don't know, maybe, you know, if you want to, we could really think about a round two. Um, yeah. And that's, that would be perfectly fine, but no, I mean, th- we're good. This okay. is great. I, yeah. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about this. And, and I, I mean, I know we went kind of into the life coach part <laughs> a lot, but I, I do think that it's important to talk about those types of things because I, I don't know, because those are just human issues that I think is really important for us to all share with each other. So I, I yeah. really, I really appreciate the opportunity to kind of talk about that and have some positive things to say, you know, right now, I think it's really important. So, so oh. thank, thanks for, thanks for letting me just kind of go off on those things. Oh, no, definitely. And thank you. You just never know where the conversation is going to lead. And again, like I never want to restrict it in any way because that's where we were and are in that moment in time. And that's what was needed to be said. And it was beautiful beyond measure. So I wouldn't have changed it for the world. Great. Great. Yeah. (laughs) Thank you for listening to the Flute 360 podcast. Please subscribe to the Flute 360 newsletter by going to HeidiKBegay.com. A pop-up will appear and you can enter in your information for the weekly newsletter. The newsletter includes great incentives, updates, and perks to the subscribers. Go ahead to HeidiKBegay.com and sign up today. Thank you.